Hi everyone and welcome to Hispanic Professionals. Today I am with Jaime Chavez. Thank you Jaime for being with me. Thank you for having me or having you. <laughs> <laughs> I am very excited for you to meet Jaime because he is in a very unique industry um, and I'll mm -hmm. let him talk about that and he has a great story to tell. But first of all, let's have him share with us about his Hispanic roots. So tell us, Jaime. So once again, like Sonia said, my name is Jaime Chavez. I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas, and both of my parents are from Mexico. My dad's from San Luis Potosí, and my mom's from Cuernavaca. Very good, that's wonderful. And I refused to talk Spanish until I was about 13 years of age, so if you're there, don't worry about it, it'll come. But once it does, embrace it. I was about 13 and it just dawned on me. We were traveling to Mexico and I thought like, I can't just go and not be able to speak. So we understood it by that point. So it was a matter of just embracing it. You actually know a lot more than you think you do. You know, that's so interesting because I've talked to other people and they haven't talked or they were not allowed to speak Spanish was that the case for you or did you just not want to talk in Spanish I was actually a very fortunate person compared to a lot of friends I actually have a lot of friends who grew up in a time when their parents restricted them from speaking Spanish because they would have an accent um, but fortunately we didn't ever grow up with that and as a matter of fact maybe because of our parents being very very Mexican they insisted in maintaining our culture and learning everything about our culture, including our language. That's wonderful. So, Good for them. But Thanks. I did have a lot of friends. They, they now look back and they hate themselves and they think back, I wish my parents would have pushed me a little harder to learn Spanish, but I have the same challenge with my 10 year old daughter. Is that right? Yes. Very interesting. Are you teaching her Spanish? Yes. We read for about three of her 10 years in Spanish. We read a Bible in Spanish for three oh, years. Yeah. So two birds with one stone. And uh, right now she's embraced it again and she has now accepted and said, Dad, I want to learn Spanish. That's great. Good for you. Excellent. So you are from obviously Mexican parents. So tell us a little bit about what you are in right now, what industry you're in and how you got started. Okay, well, I'm, I'm actually a professional DJ and master of ceremonies. That is actually where I started, which is kind of the ironic part, but back in high school, I had a dream that I was walking down the hallway and I saw a poster board. I come from the barrio, so we didn't have any fancy signage or electronic signs. We would have to draw these poster boards that would say the name of the dance, and I won't share that name, uh, but at the bottom it read DJ Jaime Chavez Sphinx Music Mobile. Mm. Why I would actually follow up on that actual dream uh, always makes me think like was this an inspired thought which I look back in my life many many years from then and I think it was. Mm -hmm. Wow so did you go and become a DJ after you ended high school or what'd you do? So I had a friend uh, whose brother was a DJ and he used to DJ at a lot of dances, a lot of weddings, quinceañeras and everything. And I went and I asked my friend, hey, can you help me out? I, I'm interested in becoming a DJ. And he said, you should really talk to my brother Ralph, who is the DJ and learn from him and I pursued that and again I don't know why I just relentlessly and immediately pursued that but I went to Ralph and I became his roadie and I started going on events uh, with him mm -hmm. and back then I used to believe that if you had one of those home consoles back then that used to have a cassette player I'm dating myself <laughs> a record player mm -hmm. a radio if I could have two of those I would have everything that I would need to be a DJ. Mm -hmm. Little did I know there's separate amplifiers and equalizers and mixers and speaker equipment. I could go down the list of so much equipment that's available, but I was completely ignorant and I didn't know what I didn't know, but thank God I had a friend whose brother accepted me as a roadie and I started learning very quickly to the point that by the following year, I DJed all our school dances, which were held once a month, except the one that I dreamt about. 
Yep. How interesting. That's wonderful. And how old were you when you started this? I had the dream when I was 16 and by 17 I was in full bloom DJing every party you can imagine. My first party with tips and everything, who knows how many hours, $35. Wow, <laughs> that's a lot of money for a teenager. That's pretty good. Well, I guess that's true. <laughs> but I look at it now, 35 yeah. That's, that's wonderful. Excellent. So did you go... So did you attend college? Did you continue DJing or what did you do? So one of the things that I did that I look back on and think, you know what, everybody should do this. I actually took aptitude tests in high school. And the weird thing was that I, my number one aptitude was pushing me to be a chef mm -hmm. of all things. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's kind of an artistic side to me, a very strong artistic inclination. And the number two thing, because I was strong at engineering or at, at science and math, was engineering. So originally I had a dream of becoming an architect because I love to draw. I've always been an artist. I've always drawn. I've, I've always excelled in elementary and middle school. People have always chosen my art. I used to sell art in elementary. Oh, wow. I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, but I wanted to be an architect from the drawing aspects of it. But I thought, by the time I get old enough to be an architect, everything's gonna be built out. There won't be any more building to do, so I better do something else. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Naive me. So anyway, I decided to pursue engineering, and I was very blessed to get a full ride uh, to Texas A&M University. Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I studied electrical engineering, and that's where my career started. So you went to college, were you still DJing or were you just simply going to school? So I have always been a DJ. Okay. From the point that I had that dream and I started pursuing this by the next year that I got all the equipment, uh, I just started DJing and every party that would come by, $60, I'm your guy. So I started DJing every single party. It was so affordable to everyone that I paid my dues and would play every single weekend during high school. Once I went to college, my sweet mate uh, was in a fraternity. He pulled me into the fraternity circles to DJ fraternity parties. I chose not to rush a fraternity so that I could continue working because that being in a fraternity would be a conflict to my DJ business. And at that point, it wasn't a business, it was just a hobby. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed DJing and obviously getting paid for it. It also helps in college. But it was nice. I had a free ride, which paid for everything plus spending. So the DJ business was just purely a, a passion play. I love, love, love being a DJ. I love people. I love the thrill and excitement of being a DJ. Uh, some would say it's probably control, but that's a different issue. <laughs> But I can't go to a party anymore and enjoy a party because I'm used to being part of the party. But I have DJed for 32 years now, nonstop, even as I became an engineering professional throughout my career. So that's interesting. So you were always DJing, but yet you continued with your engineering career. What made you stop that and become full time? DJ. So I was very blessed with the engineering career. I, I love engineering. I, I was blessed with some gifts. I always say thank you God for blessing me with the gifts of, of math and science and analytical skills and stuff. I'm a very, very analytical guy and the engineering side just really brings that out. But I also feel that I was blessed with artistic talents. And I was able to exercise those artistic talents through being a DJ and loving music and being passionate about music and doing those things that's so much more an artistic thing. So I, I pursued my path in engineering. I went to work for IBM. I started doing internships at IBM. I did four internships. And before they had a hiring freeze during my senior year in college, they extended an offer two weeks into my senior year. So I was very lucky to get that position early on. I continued once I graduated from Texas A&M. 
Uh, I went to work for IBM in Austin and I started doing power systems development. And I think too, one of the things that you were asking about earlier, when they asked me to design my very first simple circuit, I had no idea what to do. I understood engineering principles. I understood about current. I understood all the fundamentals. But what you learn in college is not exactly what you experience in the real world. So I went to one of the lead engineers and I asked him, hey, Randy, how do I do this? And in about five minutes, he explained to me that I needed to look up this in this book and do this in this CAD system and I needed to do this and that. And he explained to me and helped me design the whole thing in five minutes. Oh, wow. And I thought, why are they hiring me? I'm, I'm a useless resource. I don't count for anything. That guy could design it in five minutes. Mm -hmm. Why employ me? And I think that was one of the first really valuable lessons that I learned in engineering um, through that experience. There came a point where there was something that nobody else wanted to do. All the engineers were yet not into digital programming and microcontrollers and all that kind of stuff. And they said, Jaime, learn this. And they handed it to me. And it was the biggest blessing of my life because that really put me in a place. At that point, most power systems engineers or power supply designers mm -hmm. have no idea what's going on in the digital field. And that was back then. So I started learning about this new digital control systems and everything. And before long, I became an expert at embedded systems design, programming microcontrollers to do a fixed function on something that can be used for cars, that can be used for phones, that can be used for power supplies, that can be used for anything. So with that, um, I was able to control our designs and now when we were going to manufacture them instead of Austin, we were going to manufacture at AT&T AT in Dallas with a million square foot facility over here. I came up here because I was the only one who understood how the whole power system worked. So all of a sudden from being the kid who didn't know anything, all of a sudden I was a specialist. And I came up to work with the power systems group and manufacturing group of AT&T up here to introduce this power supply and build test procedures and reprogram the supply to do different things. And up here at AT&T, they were just learning to do that as well. So while I was here, they indirectly told me, if you ever need a job, call us. And I guess about the fourth year at IBM, I felt I felt something inside that told me it's time to leave. It's time to leave. And we've talked about being inspired by the Holy Spirit. The only thing that I can attribute in my life to these moves has always been something spiritual, right? Why would you get this compelling desire out of nowhere to know that it's time for you to go? And I have worked for three major corporations worldwide corporations, AT&T, obviously, IBM, and microchip, multi-billion dollar semiconductor company. And every single time, I have felt something in me at the fourth year to leave. And it always took me to the fifth year. I'm a very slow learner. It took me to the fifth year to leave each of those companies. So once I came up to work for AT&T, that was really nice as we started evaluating new microcontroller technology to displace the old company. Guess who was the expert? Guess who was the interface for the new company, Microchip? It was Jaime. So again, private meetings, uh, private lunch. Jaime, if you ever need a job, <laughs> if you'd like to start working in the field as a field application engineer, call us. And they pursued me and it was in sync with that fourth year and fifth year. I was just waiting for uh, stock options to, uh, to come to terms so I could cash out. I took advantage of a program that came through AT&T where they needed to downsize. 
So I got paid, I collected all my bonuses, and I had a job waiting for me, and I took about a month off. Um, and ironically, AT&T hired me back for two weeks of that month. I told them I'd only give them two weeks to become a consultant to them to continue modifying the power supply that I had created. And that design of mine, which I did system engineering, hardware engineering, um, all the customer facing duties, flying back and forth to California, um, and all the embedded systems design, I did all those things for the company and that design fed the whole business unit for three consecutive years. So I look back and I think, I never give myself enough credit for knowing enough, but I look back at it and I think like, wow, that design that I worked on, um, that's what fed the company, the whole business unit down here in Mesquite for three years. So I think like, well, that, that's a nice indicator. And as I went through that process, if you don't believe in the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I've always thought as an engineer, it would be really nice to have a patent, right? That would kind of seal the deal and say, that guy is an engineer. And on December 24th, many years ago, I didn't receive the notice about the patent, but I started receiving all the mail from all the companies that print, uh, print plaques and awards so that I can embody the, the patent that I had just received from AT&T or Lucent Technologies at that time. Wow. So that was a real blessing as were all the bonuses and everything that came through. That same Christmas, uh, I had just bought a house and I paid as much as I could up front and I thought, I'm glad I'm Mexican. Here's our heritage again. <laughs> All I have to do is eat rice and beans for the next couple of months I, until I can build up some type of savings to live. Um, and I remember it was right about Christmas time and my new home had this really tall ceilings in the front room and I wanted to get a tall, a 12 foot Christmas tree. Oh wow. And I went and looked at them and I thought there is no way I would ever buy something like this and I just sat there and I thought like I'm gonna go home eat my rice and beans forget about the Christmas tree maybe I'll draw a picture of a Christmas tree and hang it up or put put up a little reasonable Christmas tree and I ended up receiving a bonus that I was not expecting that was right about the same amount as the cost of that Christmas tree that I had looked at. Oh my goodness. I started crying and I went out and I knew it was God saying, go buy that Christmas tree. And if, if I can go back to, if you'll indulge me to go back to my childhood. Yeah. I remember we had a neighbor growing up, which is my mom's best friend still to this day. Mm -hmm. They did very, very well launching a concrete company, pouring, uh, pouring concrete for Pep Boys and a bunch of subdivisions and stuff. And they created a multi-million dollar company and they had everything they needed, everything they wanted. So they decided not to put up a Christmas tree. And when she, when my mom asked her like, why haven't y'all put up a Christmas tree? She shared like, we have everything we need. Mm -hmm. So they were associating the Christmas tree to all the Christmas presents that they didn't need because they had everything they wanted. And my mom made a comment that has stayed with me my entire life is, that's not the reason we put up a Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. Next morning, we had another Christmas tree in our neighborhood. So that was nice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, you know, I'm sorry to stop you because your, your story is really very compelling, but there's a lot of things there that you've mentioned that I think would be great for uh, you to expand on. It seems like your faith is very important to you. Mm -hmm. It seems like not only are you listening to God, but you're also watching Him work in your life. You're not taking specific situations just as something as a coincidence. You're attributing it to Him. Tell me a little bit about your faith life, how important it is to you and all of that. Well, I'll start by acknowledging my father. You can pretend he's right here. His name is Jose. My father, Jose, who is a carpenter, 
Ah. Let's fit into all those stereotypes, right? Yeah. He's a very, very humble man to the point that I have always said, if I can be half of what my father is, I'll be a very successful man. And my dad's faith has always been beyond compare. There's no doubt that everything that he has accomplished in this life, anything that has happened that's been positive, he's always attributed that to God. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful that my parents were very strict in continuing developing us through the church, the Catholic Church. I'm very Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've never missed a beat there. It gives me a lot of pride in Pride's probably the wrong word to be using that my daughter has never, ever, ever missed a beat when it came to her Catholic upbringing, including those three years that we read a Spanish Bible. She would read the Spanish Bible alongside me. She can read really well, even though she doesn't speak Spanish yet. But one day she asked me like, Dad, you always attribute everything to God. And I told her, yes. And I see that her faith is following in lockstep mm -hmm. because that's always been our priority. And this sounds kind of weird, but I say like if my daughter were to pass away, which is the worst thing that a parent can experience, mm -hmm. I still have my faith. Mm -hmm. So my faith can get me through anything. So it's, it's very important to understand that that is the foundation of our lives. Right now, heading towards 50, I'm on the other side of the spectrum. And it's been really interesting when you start realizing that you don't want for anything and you don't really need for anything and you're ahead of everything and everything's paid off. And you start pondering the bigger picture in life and you start wondering what it's all about. And without faith, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. You've got nothing. And there's a lot of deep diving we can do in that, but without your faith, you have absolutely nothing. So anyway, thank you for the question. No, not at all my pleasure. You know, I think it's it's really critical for us um, to think about why our lives are the way that we are. And for many people, including myself, our faith is kind of the driver and it propels us to do what we do and it helps us see life in a very different light. It gives perspective and a deeper and a richer meaning. And so I'm glad that you were able to touch on that and kind of expand because I think that that's important. So uh, let me add one piece. Or, yes, that's okay. So I'll give you concrete examples that you can take back and ask yourself, what is that about? So when I was working for AT&T, I used to work with an engineer named Steve. Steve is a brilliant designer. He can design anything, mechanical, electrical. He's the only guy who will put his hands on electrical wires that are hot and he knows the proper sequence so he doesn't get electrocuted, but most electrical engineers are afraid to do that. This guy and I used to have lunch every single day. And when I had reached that fourth year at AT&T, I was sitting across the table at a Mexican restaurant <laughs> where we used to go on a re very regular basis and I felt like my heart wanted to explode because I was really, really feeling this, this sensation that I needed to leave. I needed to leave. I didn't understand why, but I needed to leave. I was, I was there and I was trying to express to Steve how I felt, how everything felt. And it seemed like Steve was still designing, right? He was still back at his desk, even though we were at lunch, designing, and it was as though I wasn't even talking to Steve. But I felt like breaking down into tears. I felt alone. I felt this, this need, this want, this desire to just, I needed to go. I needed to something. And there was a booth adjacent to ours. And there was an old lady uh, eating with her grandson. And at that moment where I felt that sense of frustration, she stood up and she walked over to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she said, it's people like you 
who give me faith in mankind. Mm. And all of a sudden, I sent, sensed this overwhelming sense of peace. And I wanted to ask her so many questions. And I wanted to ask her why she had said that. But I knew that that was the Lord just coming into my life at the moment that I really, really needed him to give me that sense of peace. And after that, I was perfectly fine. And kind of like anticipating wanting to leave. All I knew is that I wanted to leave, but I wasn't proactively searching for jobs. In each of the two cases when I moved, the jobs were given to me. And I don't think that just happens, that you want and somebody brings you what you want, unless it comes from the Lord. That's a gift from God. And I've always attributed those things. It's only through the Holy Spirit that people are all being touched and doing everything that they need so that we can continue to fulfill this greater glory of God. We've, we've got to do our own little piece. Mm -hmm. We never know exactly what that is, but we have to be open. We have to be empty so that the Lord can work through us to accomplish what he's trying to accomplish. But at the end of the day, it's for his greater glory that we all push forward together. And each of us is going to receive our own set of gifts, our own set of antennas to, to hear all this. But if we can just put ourselves out there and just open our hearts and our minds and everything. Everyone talks about meditation, the importance of meditation, meditation, meditation. And I think that's a very safe word. Nobody will talk about meditating in a negative way like, oh, that's too religious or that's too this or that's too that. Meditation is meditation, but... I look at it and think like that's the opportunity for you to silence yourself and be open to listening to what the Holy Spirit has in store for us. And if you can learn to live your life where you are listening, and that's not to say that I'm a good listener, <laughs> uh, there are going to be those opportunities where the Holy Spirit is going to guide you. And if you can make that more and more and more of your life, um, it takes all the stress out of trying to control your life, trying to take charge, trying to figure out what to do, what to say. Um, just listen and you'll be inspired. Inspiracion, right? Yeah, yeah. You'll have the breath of God to, to guide all, all your actions. So when I was ready to leave, Blue sent the other thing that was the, the other push. Actually, it was when I was getting ready to leave microchip. I was at the back of the church. I probably got there late. See? <laughs> Always sinning. <laughs> I was at the back of the church, kneeling, reflecting on the scripture of the parting of the seas. And in a moment's notice, it resonated me what it meant. It, that whole thing is about heading in the path to the most unlikely direction that you would ever expect to go. But if you go with all your faith, just like the waters parted, doors are gonna open up for you. And as soon as all that resonated with me, it wasn't long before I actually took action and resigned from my position for microchip. And that was one of those, I didn't have any questions, I didn't have any anything, but I quit my third corporate job and just walked away not having a clue what I was going to do. I had no earthly idea, but I was at complete, complete peace with resigning. And I don't know where you can get that kind of peace if you want to control your life and if you want to make decisions and take the right steps. But it's been an amazing journey because once you jump, and you've got to watch Steve Harvey's video on jumping, I'm at the most vulnerable place in my life. And I've always wanted to keep my foot in the door in engineering. And I still have a whole family in the engineering circles who has tried over and over to recruit me back. And they have offered me all kinds of crazy money, bonuses, all kinds of stuff. Texas Instruments recently reached out to me to become their director to run a multimedia uh, space that they're going to open up. That was so tempting. 
But every time I think about my foot in that direction, I always think that's a security measure that I'm trying to grasp for. And being out here as an entrepreneur, not knowing where your next work is going to come from, your next dollar is going to come from, you have to rely on something. And to me, that's God. And this comes back to if you don't have a foundation in faith, start working on it. <laughs> and only once you become open to it and you learn enough, will you start hearing all these things. But that's the only thing that I have to rely on. And I like, I like the idea that even the birds eat. Mm. The birds don't wake up in the morning and say, hey, if I get up earlier today, I can beat all the other birds in the sky because I know the worms come out really early when there's dew on the grass. So if I can get there first, I can get that worm and probably a bunch of other worms, mm -hmm. which seems like a description of the rat race that we're in, but even the birds eat. So that gives me a lot of faith that our creator has created us and he said that if we have dominion over all the animals, how much more are we important to him? And it's he going to feed us. So as, as I pray the Our Father, I always thank him for our daily bread, that spiritual nourishment. Every time I get a job, I get on my knees and I pray to God and I thank God for every, my daily bread that I receive almost on a daily basis. So, yeah. You know, that is... There's so much to talk about just in, in what you've yeah. shared, seriously. Um, first of all, the fact that it's important, I think, for us to take time and be. Mm -hmm. And you've heard me say this before, probably in some other videos, we are human beings, not human doings. And before we do, we have to be. And so if we're not comfortable taking time out to really think, mm -hmm. pray, most especially listening, there is such a thing as the school of silence that you have to go into mm -hmm. and, and really listen to God. Then you can't see how the events of your life are positioning you to take you to the next step. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really important about what you said. The other thing is that you want to be able to know and discern, and it's not always easy, just like you've been mentioning, where your next step should be and or why it's happening and i think that many times only through being in that school of silence can you really look and see what is better for me and why am i making that decisions questioning your decisions so that you are making an educated guess as best as you can so that you know what direction you're going in and most especially if you are and jaime is going to tell us if you're making um, a difference in the world it's not always going to be easy so really trying to understand that there are certain things you have to go through in order to keep to keep moving forward in the direction that you are thinking that you're praying about so um, so you're not obviously in engineering right now right so are you now currently doing all of your emceeing and DJing at this point I start trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And I think that process took about three more months. And at that point, I started filling time promoting my father's business, the father who's a carpenter. And I started getting us a ton of work. But all of a sudden, I wanted to do kind of marketing and sales for my dad. And we got so much work that I started getting pulled into the work. And fortunately, I'm intelligent enough to know that that will never pay for my time or those type of things. There's not enough margin in that business to be living off that. I just wanted to serve him and his business and kind of kickstart it into a different place. So I pulled myself out of that and I started thinking, what do I know best to do? So I started thinking, well, at that point, I had 18 years of experience being a DJ and while I was still an engineer, I had started going to DJ association meetings. So you never I, stopped being a DJ? I've always okay. been a DJ. Okay. Always, always, always okay. been a DJ. So I knew a handful of DJs. So I thought, let me anchor this business. So I went to DJ with the top DJs. 
And it was amazing to me, people who were dedicated to DJing their entire lives, or actually they've also been through transition points as well, they were doing so much more. And it was so meaningful and so much more purposeful. And it was like a whole different experience that they were creating with their events. And that got me really excited. So I, I got onto my path of, let me anchor my business, but I started educating myself. And when you're an entrepreneur, or even if you're not an entrepreneur, you should always have this lifelong learning approach. You're never gonna know enough. And there's so many things, fascinating things to learn about. But if you can keep your energies focused on what you're inspired with, it's amazing that you can become anything that you decide to do. They say your world's your oyster. Mm -hmm. So as I started learning these things, I was very blessed to have a couple of friends who helped me in the industry. I'll say thank you, Andy Austin, one of the top DJs in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He was very generous and kind of took me under his wing and started sending me leads. Mm -hmm. And I started, I went to help him and I went to help three other of the top DJs and I realized I don't know anything. And that's a very humbling thought, especially for an entertainer. An entertainer normally goes into the business because they need the pat on the back. They need some type of affirmation. But, um, and I realized I don't know anything and that really put me in a very humble place and it's very important to be in that place because if you're humble, you can actually be much more receptive to learning, to accepting the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. All these things just kind of come together. And I started learning and I met some of the world's best masters of ceremonies, the best entertainers and the best everything. And one of my closest friends today is a man named Mark Farrell, uh, who's out in Mammoth Mountain in California, a glorious, glorious place where he is. And he and his wife, Rebecca, uh, they had such an amazing marriage. They had such an amazing wedding day. They, they, they thought, wow, we just look back at our wedding and we think we were so blessed and we felt so much love in the room. They said, why don't we start DJing weddings? Mm -hmm. And that's why they got into the wedding business. Mm -hmm. Mark now, many, 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 many years later, sorry, Mark, <laughs> calling you out on that, uh, teaches classes that he believes can't be taught online. Mm -hmm. He does workshops where you actually have to stand with a microphone mm -hmm. and present. And before that, you've been developing all this content, but at the heart of it all is everything that he's trying to get you is to a place of authenticity and relationship all rooted in love. Mm -hmm. So I would say he was one of the people who has inspired our whole industry he's one of the highest men on the totem pole not because he wants to be the highest man on the totem pole just because so many people respect him it, it's so amazing he doesn't have to say anything and this is such a concrete example that he will be the main speaker the opening keynote speaker for our conferences that have well over a thousand people a thousand DJs DJs are cheap most of them don't go to conferences but <laughs> If you can imagine a room full of over a thousand people and Mark walks on stage and stands at the podium and the whole room just sweeps silence. It's the most amazing thing. And I think, uh, I think fundamentally every human being is broken, but coming back to entertainers, I think entertainers needing that affirmation if you keep digging deeper and deeper and deeper, it's all about love and everything that Mark exemplifies is love. Mm -hmm. So anyone who trains under Mark, anyone who listens under Mark, you know that there's no politics, there's no coercing us into buying his DVDs or books or anything. He refuses to write books, record DVDs. He just wants a workshop where he can get you into the room and try to pull the best you out of you. And when you start looking at the nature of what that is, you start realizing that it's not about you. 
right? It's about who we're serving. And I think that's a wonderful le a life lesson is it's not about us at the end of the day. It's about what we come to do with the gifts that we've been blessed with. So when I start looking at, I, I've come back from many, many workshops with Mark and Bill Herman, the entertainment experience and all that stuff where we do clearing exercises, a lot of psychological help that we receive at all these things as the process of trying to grow in our craft. But it all comes to the end of, at the end of the day, it comes to emptying ourselves and getting rid of our own ego. Sound familiar yet? Mm -hmm. Empty ourselves so something can work through us so that we can be of service to everyone around us. So coming back from trainings like that and reevaluating my business has put me in a place where I think it, about things in a very purposeful way. What would a very purpose-based wedding look like? And I think about what most weddings look like. From my perspective as a DJ, people think I need music for my wedding. And there's another leader in our industry, Peter Mary, who wrote the best wedding reception ever, who talks about Everyone always thinks of their wedding as to how it's going to look, but nobody thinks about how it's going to be. And you talk about it's so important to be. So as a, a DJ, as a master of ceremonies, as an entertainer, I feel it is my role to bring to life something that already exists in the room. People are coming because they love each of these people, mm -hmm. right? The bride and the groom. And I go as far as saying the bride's family comes because they love the bride and the groom's family comes because they love the groom. So step one, when I introduce the bride and groom, what if I gave or inspired the other side of the family to fall in love with the person they'd come for, the person that they love? Can they walk away from a wedding going like, you know what? I love them as a couple. I'm glad she met. I'm glad he met. So by going through and having them do homework, I have my clients do a lot of homework because the more they put into it, the more they're going to get out of it. And I think that's true about life as well. The more you put into anything, the more you're going to get out of it. So I invest very, very heavily in building relationships with my clients so that as their master of ceremonies, I can properly represent their family and their friends. And again, an entertainer might normally think like, oh my God, that's a huge responsibility on me. What if I say the wrong thing? What if I, and as soon as you start asking those type of questions, once again, you're reflecting on yourself mm -hmm. and you're not thinking about your client. Mm -hmm. But if you do all the work and you learn about them and you love them and you know everything about them, you have a duty. This is your part of the, your contribution to the greater glory. You have a duty to that family. You have, they need someone with your skills and your unique gifts and your expertise to bring out all the love that's already in the room to bring out all the excitement that's in the room, to give them permission to be themselves, mm -hmm. give them permission to relax, give them permission to have fun, right? So I feel like I'm almost facilitating. I'm not the leader. I'm just facilitating all of this. And the more things you can learn and the more proficient you can become at understanding the whole psychology of events, the different techniques, different ways to approach people, the way to do things in the proper way, because there is a natural order. Once again, we could get more, more philosophical or religious on that. But there's a proper order to things. And if you can respect all those things, you're going to see the most amazing things happen. And you can only go back and have gratitude. I always end my nights at home, sometimes even as far as crying and just thanking God that I was chosen to be part of that family for that moment in time that happens to be one of the most special days in their life. And now we've been able to expand their event beforehand and the memories afterwards so that that can live and breathe as part of their life for the rest of their years together. And I feel like that's part of my ministry 
is really trying to help marriages go the distance. Just a little push. And that's been my little contribution towards this greater, this greater glory. No, I think that is so... Also, you're a very deep man. Um, I'm sure you're all picking up on this. But I think some really important things for us to think about that Jaime mentioned was, number one, he uses what he has for the sake of others, which is, I think, basically what we're all meant to do. Our gifts are not meant for us. And so I think that that's the first thing. The second thing is that when you stop thinking about self and make it about other people, everything just comes together. You, your whole persona just changes because it's no longer about me, what am I doing wrong, but it's more about the other people that I'm working with. And finally, really just being there, being present, and, and, and thanking God as as. Many times I, I hear nowadays, especially that they're everybody saying we need to be grateful, 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 and gratitude, and that's wonderful. But we have to think about who we need to be grateful to for everything that we're doing. So I think that those are really important things that are um, that would be good for us to kind of think about. And the fact that Jaime is so open, thank you for for sharing so much. It's not about me. <laughs> that's true. That's true. So let me ask you this. So. Um, I was reading your website and you've got excellent reviews from all of your, your clients. Um, and they talk about the fact that you, you don't, I mean, you're just not into presenting the family and making sure everything goes well. You've got lighting, you've got props. You, they said, one of your testimonials said that one of the grandmothers was in, in her eighties dancing and all that. So, I mean, really you just incorporate everybody. So, and then you mentioned at the very end my ministry so mm -hmm. we went from a career right. to ministry so you're seeing this as a greater calling obviously right. and so how did you get to that i think as i start they say hindsight is 2020 when you start looking back at your life and everything that's happened you can go and backtrack and think like was my dream in high school inspired Stepping stone number one, right? I took this aptitude test that said I should be a chef. And by the way, I cook twice a day at least. And I'm a great chef. Mm -hmm. And if, if and when I retire from this particular point in my life, I would like to become a chef. So we'll just put that out there. Yeah. <laughs> um, was following the aptitude test into engineering a way to put me as another stepping stone into engineering so I could learn critical thinking skills, right? Design engineering just changes how you think about stuff. And by the way, you go to school just to affirm that you are teachable and based on the profession you choose as an, any type of engineer, you're going to learn critical thinking as an architect. You might learn engineering critical skills as well or you might heavily lean towards art. But anyway, all those things are stepping stones. So I think as an engineer, was that forming the foundation to give me a very systematic approach to everything? And if you look at me today or my business today, I have so many processes and templates and all kinds of crazy stuff in place that only come through my engineering ex uh, experience of taking anything and breaking it up into fundamental parts. Was that a stepping stone? Uh, while I was going in parallel, still being a DJ was one side, working on my inner introvert and the other one working on the extrovert. So those could come together, right? Somebody said deja vu is when you come to a point in your life where you're supposed to be, because it is so familiar, they say that's where you're supposed to be. That's why it resonates so hard with you. But was I working in those two parallel paths to get to a place where I could become an engineer who started working in the field and presenting worldwide? I, I've taught in Buenos Aires, in Canada, in California, all of Central America, four state region, Arizona. I'm, I'm a very good educator. That's one of, one of the gifts or one of the talents that has evolved from all this. So, I went out into the field and became very customer facing. 
So dealing with executives, dealing with engineers, being able to relate on the design side all the way up to the business side, right? Working with marketing, working with sales, understanding the value of all the different pieces and how they come together so that I would be inspired to walk away not knowing what I was going to do and put all these things together to create a business where all those stepping stones to get me there. And it was interesting over the last year and a half, now that I've re refined my speaking skills, not that this is testimony, but <laughs> refined my speaking skills and running business and understanding business, I was asked to become a church leader and to teach all the lectors at the church to read. Mm -hmm. And I started doing this very consistently. And one of the things that came out of those lecture trainings is it seems like you know what to tell each person to get them to be the best self, to get them to become their best own reader, their best own lector. And again, is this helping the greater community? Is this helping our church to grow? Is it easier to understand uh, each of the readings each Sunday if they're being interpreted a little bit better? So has all this DJ and MC work been leading to this? And as I went into the leadership role there, now I'm part of the leadership team at St. Anne's Community, which is one of the top 10 wealthiest parishes in the nation, mm -hmm. who's setting the standards on how communities operate, how carnivals operate, how all these different things. And then I look back at my roots. So let's tie it all back into our Hispanic heritage. Is St. Anne's has done a great job with their all American, or I should say English speaking community. And they also did a great job building up a very strong Hispanic community, but they're divided. Mm -hmm. And there's this huge schism between the two which looks exactly like the schism that I've been trying to teach to create a bridge over for DJs. I've tried to teach them about Latin music, about Latin tradi traditions, about all these things. And I'm thinking that schism exists everywhere. And it's only with people like you and me who are bilingual, who can actually bridge the two together. So is there a place for you to be doing that in whatever market you choose, in whatever profession. Keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, keep your heart open as you go into the professional world as a Hispanic. Is there a bridge that you can build to help the two come together? And I think since Hispanics are the most prolific at creating families, <laughs> Hispanics are just gonna become more and more prominent in our culture and that divide Unfortunately, as generations pass, we tend to let go of our heritage. We're speaking less and less Spanish, but we're becoming more and more bilingual a community, more Hispanic mixed with everything else, and we're losing the beautiful gift of our language. And I just wonder if that was a stepping stone for something. And then there's something bigger than that. And uh, we won't talk about software development. We won't talk about other engineering pursuits and stuff, but those are stepping stones of the future. But I will say, if, if you can read the Bible from front to back, it'll be one of the most peaceful times in your life, and the Bible has every single answer. Mm -hmm. And one of the things it talks about is later in your life, you're actually going to have to start, uh, start having dreams. And I think that dream time and that meditation time is where you're told a lot. And it seems uh, I've been going through the last six weeks where every single night I have had dreams that reinforce through, through totems, uh, that reinforce everything that I'm thinking and giving me answers to all the wonderful things that are coming in life. And just being human, I want to get to those things sooner than later, but... You have to go back to all the cardinal virtues and think of, think about patience and think about all the things that we need to be because it all happens in God's time and not our time. But I just want to continue to be aware that 
all of this is happening for something that's way beyond me. It's way beyond all of us. But we still need to do our part. And the more we can empty ourselves and listen, we can do it successfully with a purpose. I, I think that's a great way of kind of circling back around to basically where Jaime started um, earlier in his teenage years and talking about how critical it is once again mm -hmm. to be open to where God is leading you. And so I'm very grateful that you've been able to share that. And I also think it's important also for us to be able to really realize that we have never arrived. It's always a process. It's not clean and it's messy and it's kind of scary at times, but it's all part of that process, the process of life. And so you mentioned talking about parting the Red Sea and all that. We walk by faith and not by sight. And so I think that that's really important to take into consideration. So you've shared a lot of great information. Thank you, Jaime, for that. What suggestions or what words of wisdom, maybe whatever you feel right now called to say, would you like to address specifically to the Hispanic youth? Hmm. So the first thing that came to my mind is you will hear everybody universally say um, balance mind, body, and soul. Mind, body, soul. Focus on balancing those things. It's really easy to get excited about career. It's really ex uh, exciting to know that you're the smartest student competing in UIL competitions or all these things or competing in sports and becoming the best athlete and trying to do all these things to outdo one another. But at the end of the day, you've got absolutely nothing to prove. And if you can just take those three things, which kind of look like the Holy Trinity, mm -hmm. right? Mind, body, and soul and feed all all three of them equally, I think your life is going to be much bigger than you could ever imagine. And that's promised to us. It's promised to us. That's wonderful. I think that that's great. And I think that that is honestly the key to everything. I think you've heard in Jaime's conversation with us that he has, he's an avid reader. So he has not only tried to cultivate himself in all these three areas, but most importantly, his spiritual life, his relationship with God, um, which sometimes many of us just kind of leave at wherever we may have been catechized. No, he's continuing to pursue that. So I think that that's really important. Jaime, can people connect with you on LinkedIn or what's the best way for them to get to know you and, and reach out to you? They can connect to me through LinkedIn, through Facebook, through following Ambiance Entertainment. Uh, we're doing a lot of great things, um, connecting all the dots through all our businesses, all our religious pursuits, through absolutely everything. But yes, through either of those and all my contact information is there. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, if there's a lot of those, I, I won't promise to get back as, too quickly, but... Uh, feel free to reach out if you feel that that thing inside that says, hey, it's time for you to jump and go watch Steve Harvey's video on jump. Uh, I think that'll put you in the right direction, point you in the right direction, and then look to me after that as a person, as an example who has jumped. Very good. Excellent. So I will have Jaime's contact information on this post. Thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for having me. <laughs> and thank all of you for watching. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to uh, post them here. And until we see each other again, take care. Good luck and keep us in your prayers. Bye-bye.